scientists group up here. Um, you know, it's um, sometimes, you know, when they're in their laboratories, uh, they might not feel like we really appreciate their work. But from the bottom of our hearts, I know that Noah truly appreciates the interest that they have in albinism. And we're very, very grateful for the time that they spend working on our issues. So to open this session, um, I would like to just say that I handed out a yellow piece of paper. It's an evaluation form. And if everybody would kindly fill that out and hand it to me, I'll be back by the doors when the session is over. Um, so you can hand it to me. And I ran out already, so I'm probably going to uh, send somebody for more. Um, so we're grateful that so many people are interested in research, because research rocks. So our first speech speaker is Dr. Murray Brilliant. Dr. Brilliant has been a Lincoln pr Professor of Genetics in the Department of Pediatrics at the University of Arizona College of Medicine since 1997. Dr. Brilliant chairs the research steering committees of the Department of Pediatrics and is the director of the genetics graduate program at the University of Arizona. He has served on editorial boards of various scientific journals and has served on numerous NIH review panels. Dr. Brilliant received his PhD in molecular, cellular, and developmental biology from the University of Colorado at Boulder in 1984. He's held faculty positions at the Jackson Laboratories in Bar Harbor, Maine, and the Fox Chase Cancer Center in Philadelphia. Dr. Brilliant has over 17 years of experience in molecular genetics of pigmentation in mice and humans, and over 50 publications in this area. In particular, his efforts have led to the identification of two of the four genes involved in oculocutaneous albinism. Dr. Brilliant's laboratory is one of the leading centers working on the functional analysis of proteins involved in albinism and the effects on genetic variations. Um, if anybody went to the genetic sessions earlier, it's our noodle doctor. And I'm really grateful to and introducing Dr. Brilliant. Uh, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, today I'm going to try to give you, uh, try to do a few things. First, I want to give you an overview of um, the genetics of, of albinism, the genes that are involved in albinism, uh, what we know um, at this point about their function, and most of that is speculation, but I hope you'll bear with me. Um, and then um, I'll also um, try to illustrate the point that these are the same genes that are involved in normal human pigment variation, and, uh, and a little bit about um, uh, a new um, gene therapy approach that we're, we're trying to accomplish. So, um, you know, being here in, in, in Las Vegas um, at, at a NOAA conference, um, it, it's a kind of a, it's a unique experience, a unique place. And, uh, you know, I overheard some people saying, you know, I, I've just never seen anything like it. You know, it's just so weird to see people with, with skin color like that. But they were talking about the Blue Man Group that's uh, also here in, in Las Vegas. So, um, anyhow. That's my joke for today. <laughs> um, so albinism is a congenital genetic abnormality of melanin synthesis. So melanin is, is that pigment um, that, that we make as human beings. And it, this is uh, an abnormality in the amount of pigment that we make by cells called melanocytes. These are pigment cells. So melanin pigment site cell. And it's a condition in which this, uh, this pigment is severely reduced or absent. And it always includes specific abnormalities of the eye. And my colleagues will talk a little bit more about those. But if we look at, at a cartoon here of a skin cell, we can see a, a melanocyte. And that's the darker cell here. And let's see if I can, if I can use the laser without, without blinding my colleagues here. So this is the melanocyte here. It's a cell with all these little fingery projections going into, into the skin. And within that cell, you see kind of uh, little, little round particles 
These are actually spheres, and within these spheres, uh, the pigment is, is uh, synthesized uh, and, and, and produced, and then these little pigment spheres, called melanosomes, are exported to the skin, and it's also exported to the developing hair. So um, what they do is they form like a little umbrella cap on the outside of the, of the cell uh, to protect the nucleus of the cell from ultraviolet radiation. Okay, so back to albinism. Um, we recognize uh, many different genes that are involved in albinism. There's the oculo, um, uh, ocular albinism gene, or OA1, that's uh, X-linked, and we talked about that a little earlier, about this kind of inheritance, which is typically seen in males, but it's not uh, impossible to be seen in females, but mostly in males. Then there are four known types of oculocutaneous albinism, that is albinism that affects the eye, skin, and hair, and the genes are listed there. Tyrosinase for OCA1, uh, something called the P gene for OCA2, a tyrosinase related protein 1 for OCA3, and for OCA4, uh, we've gone through a number of name changes. Um, it used to be called MATP, um, and now we have a much, much uh, easier name, SLC45A2. Okay which is distinctive from another gene involved in pigmentation, which is called SLC24A5, which we'll talk about in a moment. Uh, and then we recognize, um, and, and it, this is a moving target, um, many genes involved in Hermansky-Pudluck syndrome, um, as well as Chidiakigashi. Okay, so I'll talk very briefly about the different forms of oculocutaneous albinism. So type one, as I said, is related to um, the, the gene encoding tyrosinase. It's about one in 40,000 worldwide, and it accounts for about 40% of the cases of oculocutaneous albinism. And in this case, it encodes an enzyme called tyrosinase, and tyrosinase is, is important. This is the tyrosinase gene here, a little cartoon. Um, and everything I do has noodles or something like that associated with it, I suppose. Um, and ty tyrosine is an amino acid, and it gets converted um, into uh, this polymer called melanin in a couple of chemical steps that I won't go into. But tyrosinase is the enzyme that's uh, important in the production of melanin. Okay, uh, type two albinism, OCA type two, uh, it's about one in 30,000 worldwide, and it accounts for about half the forms of oculocutaneous albinism that we see. Um, it's more common among people of uh, African descent and also uh, among Native Americans. And what we think that do does is that it, it's, it's like a little tube here in, uh, in that, uh, that transports something called anions, which for the purposes of this might be something like a chloride ion. We also have um, something called a, a, a proton pump here. Um, uh, this is uh, uh, this ATPase here. And these two together make for an acidic environment inside this uh, melanosome. And um, for reasons that we're not too to clear on, this is an important process in making melanin. The reason we're not too, too clear about this is that this enzyme doesn't like to work when conditions are acidic, but yet in the absence of making this acidic, we can't make melanin. Okay, so we have a bit of a conundrum here which we're trying to understand. OCA3 is pretty rare uh, worldwide but about one in 8,500 um, people in South Africa have this. Um, and we, we're not sure of the function of, of the uh, OCA3 gene. It's a, it's a protein that's related to tyrosinase. It's not necessary to make, um, but it does, we think it may help to stabilize tyrosinase in some way. OCA4 is fairly rare worldwide, and this is the latest form of albinism to be identified. Uh, however, it accounts for more than a quarter of the cases of oculocutaneous albinism in Japan. Uh, the gentleman uh, shown in the picture here is from Turkey, 
and he would uh, otherwise have a much darker pigmentation. And what that does is illustrated here, and we think it actually, um, it actually helps to, to control um, the overall uh, conditions within the melanosome, within this sphere where melanin is made, and it has to do with uh, balancing water in this, in this sphere and making the sphere bigger or smaller. Okay, and these are two Turkish cousins with OCA4, and this is one of the typical medical uh, journal pictures of Japanese children uh, with OCA4. Okay, so I alluded to the fact that um, many of these genes that we see that are associated with albinism are also responsible for normal human pigmentation variation. And uh, why, why do human beings come in different colors in the first place? Well, a lot of this has to do with um, the effects, uh, the balance between um, uh, uh, ultraviolet radiation and our need to make vitamin D and our need to protect our skin against ultraviolet radiation. So um, human beings have the ability to, to, um, to um, utilize ultraviolet light hitting our skin to make vitamin D and that's important in metabolizing calcium and, and, and phosphate. Um, we can also get vitamin D in our diets, um, and these days with uh, vitamin D fortified milk, we, we don't generally need to be in the sun to make vitamin D. Um, however, um, as, as we know, and, and as those of you with albinism know more than the rest of us, um, ultraviolet light causes severe, can cause severe uh, damage to your skin. So the reason we have melanin in our skin is really to help protect us against this ultraviolet um, radiation, but not so much to decrease our ability to make uh, vitamin D. There are some other genes that are not, uh, not yet known to be associated with albinism that are important in human pigmentation variation. And these include a gene called MC1R and one called ASP. Um, MC1R is, uh, variations in this are associated with uh, most forms of red hair in human populations. And there's another gene called Golden, which is again one of these SLC genes, SLC24A5, which I'll just call Golden for, for ease here. Um, that's associated with uh, major differences in, in pigmentation in ethnic groups. So uh, uh, European, Caucasian people have one form of this golden gene, and other world populations, Africans, Asians, etc., have another form of this golden gene. And when we put all of this together, um, we get a very complex map here. But we see that, that golden here is also associated with changing these, these ions and the conditions inside this melanosome, this sphere that's, that is the factory for making uh, melanin pigment. So we have all of these different factors that regulate um, different ions going in, different salt conditions, different pH, and that sort of thing to optimize our ability to make melanin or to regulate it in some ways. So we know, for example, that some of these genes are more active, perhaps in the eye than in the skin. And so you, you can see how that could uh, vary. We could have people with lighter eye color, darker skin, that sort of thing. OK. So we did a study um, to, um, to, to see how these small changes in small changes in these genes that uh, some of which are associated with albinism, how do they affect um, the the range of pigmentation that we see among human beings? So we measured skin pigmentation uh, by a reflectometer. This bounces uh, known wavelengths of light onto the skin and measures the reflection of those uh, wavelengths of light. And uh, when we do all these mathematical models we come up with um, three genes that control nearly 50% of the variation that we see between human beings in their skin pigment. And this includes this OCA4 gene, as well as the golden gene and this um, ASIP gene. 
in looking at hair color, um, hair color is the result of, of the absolute amount of pigment that we have in our hair and also a ratio of the black pigment to red pigment. These are two different kinds of melanin that, that we make. And we can make a kind of a map here. Down, down in this corner is black hair. In this, in this corner is blonde hair. This is dark red hair. Uh, sorry, it doesn't show up so well. And this would be, say, strawberry blonde hair here. So we're going from uh, black to red, uh, uh, a change in the ratio of black to red on this, uh, in this part, and here going from dark to light. So when we examine these two different um, parameters, when we look at, at what are the genes that control the total amount of pigment in our hair, we come up with this golden gene, we come up with the OCA4 gene and the OCA2 gene that control really the vast amount of the genetic variation among human beings. When we look at the ratio of black to red hair, we come up with the OCA4 gene, the golden gene, and, the, and this MC1R gene that had previously been associated with, um, with whether you have red hair or not. So that about, explains about 43% of the genetic variation among human beings. So that means that we still have a, a long ways to go to understand you know, what are the other genes involved, for example. In eye color, it's very interesting, when we bin eye color this way with blue and green together and then these other colors here, and we give them sort of a numerical order. The OCA2 gene itself is responsible for 74% of the variation. And what's more interesting is the change that we see, it's a single change in the DNA. You know, we have about uh, three to four billion uh, of these um, uh, nucleotides that make up our DNA. But it's only one change, one, one part per three to four billion that leads to, that, that, that um, is associated with eye color differences. And this change is not in the part of the gene that encodes the protein. It's in the part of the gene that regulates kind of where and how uh, strong this gene is going to be turned on. And we think it, it has to do with, uh, with the control of this gene, how much is expressed in the eye versus other tissues. Uh, but that single change in, in the nucleotide explains the vast majority of, of eye color variation in human beings. So I'm going to move on, um, since uh, we have a lot of people talking, I, I want to move on to an, another study that we're doing. And this has to do with uh, gene therapy. And we'll hear a little bit more about that also at the end of, of this session. So the conventional approach to gene therapy uh, at this point is to, you know, if somebody has, uh, say, a recessive, um, a recessive trait, they lack the ability to express that gene. So typically what has been done until now is to give them a new copy of this gene, a copy that functions. And then we inject it into the cell. It finds its way into the chromosomes. It integrates into the chromosomes, and that's shown, shown uh, you know, here. And it can go in in various places. Sometimes it goes into a, a neutral place, and you know, it gets expressed, and we have rescue of this particular cell. Now it can make this protein, whereas before it couldn't. But sometimes it goes into a, a, another gene and causes some other problem. And so we don't want to replace one problem with another problem, which could be potentially even more damaging.